Imagine you've got a train and it's hurtling down a track. In its path, five people are trapped on the line and cannot escape. Fortunately, you can flick a switch which diverts the train down a fork in that track away from those five people, but at a price. There is another person trapped down that fork and the train will kill them instead. Question, should you flick the switch? Now, most people uh, have little trouble deciding what to do under those circumstances. Uh, though the, the thought of flicking the switch isn't exactly a nice one, uh, the utilitarian choice, as it were, killing just the one person instead of the five, represents the least worst option. Okay? But now let me give you uh, a variation. You've got a train speeding out of control down a track. Um, and it's going to plough into five people on the line. But this time you are standing behind a very large stranger on a footbridge above that track. The only way to save the people is to heave the stranger over. He will fall to a certain death, but his considerable bulk will block the train, saving five lives. We'll, we can describe a psychopath or psychopathy as a, as a clinical construct uh, characterized by a cluster of uh, characteristics and features. And the cluster would include interpersonal characteristics, how we deal with other people, how the individual interacts with somebody else, affective char characteristics, um, feelings, emotions, and uh, uh, other behaviors, including uh, socially deviant behaviors. Psychopaths are often described as callous impulsive, manipulative, glib, egocentric, predatory, grandiose, and lacking empathy and emotional affect. Hare's study of what makes up a psychopathic personality has taken him down many avenues of scientific inquiry. I've been working in this area for quite a long time and for the first 10 or 15 years, I, like most other researchers and clinicians, are very frustrated by the fact that we didn't have some sort of standardized measure of this particular construct. People intuitively knew what they were talking about. If, if, if one read Herbie Cleckley's book, The Mask of Sanity, for example, you would have a pretty good idea about what a psychopath is, but how do you communicate that to somebody else? The problem is that we have never had a proper measuring tool for assessing this particular disorder. In the early 1980s, Hare and his colleagues developed a psychometric test, now known as the Psychopathy Checklist Revised. Consisting of a 20-item rating scale, the checklist measures such things as glibness, superficial charm, cunning, manipulative behavior, lack of remorse or guilt, shallow affect, callousness, lack of empathy, impulsiveness. Each item is scored on the basis of explicit criteria contained in the manual. Possible scores on the scale range from 0 to 40. For the average person, a typical score would be 5. Anyone with a score of 30 or above would be considered a psychopath. I'm going to start with asking you some questions about your behavior when you were young. Uh, did you ever do anything, did you ever get in trouble at school? To assess a subject, a trained clinician integrates information from a person's file and other collateral data. It is estimated that about 1% of the population may have the disorder. Many, like Pat Frizzell, imprisoned for violent crimes, are denied parole. They are three times more likely to reoffend and four times more likely to violently reoffend. The checklist is widely used around the world and has proven both reliable and valid as a predictor of criminal and violent behavior. Because psychopaths are high risk for breaking the law, many end up in jail. Of inmates serving sentences for violent crimes, about 20% score high on the psychopathy checklist. It is a disturbing fact, however, that the great majority of psychopaths are out in the real world undetected. They live on the narrow margins of the law, often engaging in cold-blooded and predatory behavior. These individuals cause incalculable damage to other people. A new study suggests 
There are actually four times as many real-life psychopaths in senior management than the rest of the workforce. Kind of scary. Psychologist Jeff Gardier joins us from New York to talk about it. Jeff, I can't imagine how many people right now are wondering, thinking, hmm, is that my boss? Uh, okay, there's a real definition of a psychopath. Explain the sure. difference between someone who just annoys you and you think is occasionally crazy, the psychopath. Well, Suzanne, we do know that uh, psychopaths share three very distinct traits. Uh, for one, they're very egocentric and very narcissistic. Uh, secondly, they, sh they, they don't have much empathy. And third, they have no conscience. In other words, they have no remorse or guilt. But we also know that they can be very cunning, they can be very aggressive, very manipulative, very charming, and they certainly do lie. And why are these people showing up in upper management? because they're perfect for these kinds of jobs because they are risk takers and we know in upper management no risk no reward and they don't tend to stay at these jobs for an extreme uh, a period of time uh, they tend to move on after two or three years so once upper management does realize that they have a psychopath or a sociopath working for them and they're no longer bringing in uh, all of the corporate profits because they're now enriching themselves they're own pleasure principle, they tend to move on to another company. All right, so two things here. How do you know if your boss is a psychopath? What should you be looking for? And if they are, what should you do? Well, one of the ways you could tell your boss is a psychopath is they don't care what happens to you. As long as you're making money for them, as long as you're producing for them, then they will keep you uh, within their world. However, once you stop uh, 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 producing or you're having some issues, they will fire you. They'll get rid of you. They don't care about you. And you can actually notice them manipulating other people, breaking rules, not necessarily laws, but you will see them acting out in that way. What do you do? First of all, don't follow their model. That's the, that's the first and most important thing. And if you see that they are breaking rules, begin to distance yourself because at some point they will get in trouble, uh, they will get fired, and you will be swept out right along with them. Our social power is taking great care to create images of psychopaths. While these are all true versions of malevolent psychopaths, Serial killers, rapists, pedophiles, and murderers are extremely rare and have very few victims. There are more common psychopaths that prey upon our society that we need to be aware of. There are two different versions of primary psychopaths. The first is distempered primary psychopaths. These are the violent predators that do not respond to punishment. The second kind of primary psychopath is the charismatic kind. They are able to live the big lie. Next to primary psychopaths, there are secondary psychopaths. These secondary psychopaths are also categorized between the distempered and the charismatic psychopath. The distempered secondary psychopath is the risk taker, but it fears actually being caught. This distempered secondary psychopath is the risk taker that creates violence, but actually fears being caught. The charismatic secondary psychopath is able to tell the small lie and live with it. The common factor in all of them is that they are hurt or deranged people who seek control over others. They do not sense or care to sense others' emotions and actually get a high off of their antisocial actions. Despite what the media says, they exist in all cultures, races, and socioeconomic levels, very much like how left-handed people are dispersed throughout all levels of society. The media usually only has us focus on the lower class violent psychopath to scare you. They never focus on the very real psychopath that is much more common. Just because they have a nice car and a nice job does not mean that you're not dealing with a psychopath. Psychopaths actually thrive in collective environments and are common at the top of most power structures including corporate, government, and religious organizations. To the psychopath, the lie is their primary weapon. The lie is the justification in their head that they have the right to cause harm. The lie is what ensnares the victims. Lying is as natural as breathing for them. They have no physiological reactions when lying like an increased heartbeat, sweating, or blushing. When caught in the lie, they just create more lies. There are different levels of psychopaths. The most common and benign form of psychopath is the narcissist. They are full of self-love to the point that they do not recognize emotions or feelings in others. They need a constant fix of adoration or attention, or they become angry or despondent. There are two types of narcissists. The sexual or somatic narcissist, obsessed with their looks, and that uses sex as a tool to get what they want. They can be health nuts, hypochondriacs, or sexually addictive people. 
They lead shallow lives and often fill the void with new thrills. The other kind of narcissist is the cerebral narcissist. They love their own minds. They are arrogant, condescending know-it-alls who talk down to you. They seek awards and recognition from their peers. Narcissists use others as a means to their own gratification and often dump those that no longer suit their needs. They always take and never give unless it is bait for something else they want. The victim is the next type of psychopath. Mostly female, this psychopath preys on the weakness they see in others, sympathy. They look weak and pitiful to garner attention and sympathy. The real reason is to lower the guard of the intended victim. They use sex as a hook to juggle multiple victims into tangled relationships. This is done to drain the victim of energy and money until they serve no purpose, at which time they just leave. Another type of psychopath is the con artist. They use their excellent lying capabilities to cheat others. They are the consummate salesperson that are driven by money and they could care less if people love them or not. Lower intellect or lower ambition con artists do short cons for quick money. Higher intellect and higher ambition con artists tell the big lie over long periods. The thing that is common in both of these cons, they take something that has no intrinsic value and inflate the perceived value to sell it to the victims and then they run. These schemes can grow large enough to take down the entire world economy as we will see later. It is not Hannibal Lecter you should fear. It is the modern psychopath like Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff stole $50 billion and had over 4,000 direct victims and hundreds of thousands of indirect victims. Entire family fortunes were lost and there were a lot of suicides. And yet he has no real remorse about what he had done. A nation can survive its fools and even the ambitious, but it cannot survive a treason from within. An enemy at the gates is less formidable, for he is known and he carries his banners openly. But the traitor moves among those within the gate freely, his sly whispers rustling through the, all the galleys, heard in every hall of government itself. For the traitor appears not a traitor. He speaks in the accents familiar to his victims, and he wears their face and their garment. He appeals to the baseness that lies deep in the hearts of all men. He rots the soul of a nation. He works secretly and unknown in the night to undermine the pillars of a city. He infects the body politic so that it can no longer resist. A murderer is less to be feared. Cicero, 42 BC. The final psychopath is the professional psychopath. This is the most destructive of all psychopaths. Like the malevolent psychopath that is so prevalent in our media, they think of nothing of killing. They just never do the acts themselves. The malevolent psychopath may only kill a few dozen. The professional psychopath in a suit can kill millions. We came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. We hang petty thieves and appoint great ones to high office. Aesop. Now we've got what we might call a real dilemma on our hands, okay? While the score in lives is precisely the same as in the first scenario, five to one, one's choice of action appears far trickier. Now, why should that be? Well, the reason it turns out all boils down to temperature, okay? Case one represents what we might call an impersonal dilemma. It involves those areas of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, the posterior parietal cortex, in particular, uh, the anterior paracingulate cortex, the temporal pole, and the superior temporal sulcus, bit of neuroanatomy for you there, uh, primarily responsible uh, for what we call cold empathy, for reasoning and rational thought. Case two, on the other hand, represents what we might call uh, a personal dilemma. Uh, it involves the emotion centre of the brain, known as the amygdala, uh, the circuitry of hot empathy, um, what we might call the feeling of feeling what another person is feeling. Now, psychopaths, just like most normal members of the population, have no trouble at all with case one. They flick the switch and the train diverts accordingly, killing just the one person instead of the five. But this is where the plot thickens. Quite unlike normal members of the population, psychopaths also experience little difficulty with case two. Psychopaths, without a moment's hesitation, 
are perfectly willing to chuck the fat guy over the rails if that's what the doctor orders. Now, moreover, this difference in behavior has a distinct neural signature. Uh, the pattern of brain activation in both normal people and psychopaths is identical on the presentation of the impersonal moral dilemma, but radically different when things start to get a bit more personal. Imagine that I were to hook you up to a brain scanner, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine, and were to present you with those two dilemmas. Okay, What would I observe as you went about trying to solve them? Well, at the precise moment that the nature of the dilemma switches from impersonal to personal, I would see the emotion center of your brain, your amygdala, and related brain circuits, the, the medial orbitofrontal cortex, for example, light up like a pinball machine. I would witness the, the moment, in other words, when emotion puts its money in the slot. But in psychopaths, I would see precisely nothing. And the passage from impersonal to personal would slip by unnoticed because that emotion neighborhood of their, their brains, that emotional zip code, has a neural curfew. And that's why they're perfectly happy to chuck that fat guy over the side without even batting an eye. These people tend to be utilitarians in our society, okay? They tend to be people who are able to get the job done, who are less morally squeamish. Now, you know, I've actually uh, presented um, a, a variation of this dilemma um, to, to, uh, to, to various psychopaths. Uh, I'll give you an example of what, this di what the variation of the dilemma is. Imagine that you um, are a transplant surgeon, okay? and you have uh, five patients all in need of a transplant, okay? So heart, lungs, whatever, whatever, okay? And they're all gonna die if they don't get that transplant, but there are no matching donors available, okay? Just by chance, a young traveler happens to walk past your surgery one day for a, uh, just a regular checkup. And it turns out, hypothetically, that he is a direct match for all five. Okay. Now imagine that you are the transplant surgeon. Imagine if there was no comeback to you if that traveller somehow disappeared. Okay. Would it be right to kill that young traveller in order to take his five organs to transplant them into your five patients? Okay. Now, okay, most people, again it's the five and one life score, it's exactly like the, the, the trolley problem. But most people would say, absolutely not. No, you know, that's, that's just not right. It's ethically not right to, 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 to kill that person. But I've given this to psychopathic killers, and they've said, well, actually, you know what? Uh, imagine if you were the families of those five guys. You know, uh, one, one life lost, is, 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 that really, is it really that bad when you're saving five others? You know, what if that guy was an evil terrorist? and the five guys uh, who needed the transplants were peace workers or aid workers, for instance, would that make it any different? Now, these are kinds of, not exactly that, but these are kinds of scenarios, these are kinds of decisions that world leaders and politicians have to grapple with. I mean, here's another little one which I conjure with. Imagine that you were, uh, hypothetically, left in a room with a newborn baby, okay? and you were left in that room for 10 minutes with that newborn baby, and I told you, and you have to believe this is true, that that newborn baby will grow one day into Adolf Hitler, okay? And I told you that there would be no moral comeback, no legal comebacks on you, were you to kill that baby with a pillow and walk out of that room. Now, what would you do? Would you kill that baby and save millions of lives further on down the line in history, or would you not be able to do it? Okay, these are moral conundrums uh, which are kind of played out in everyday life. I'm, 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 I'm obviously re reducing these to absurdities, but these are kinds of the kinds of decisions on a lesser level that you have to make if you're a, if you're a politician or if you're a world leader. Sending anyone out into battle knowing that there's a chance that they might not come back, you know, committing thousands of troops to a war is something that you know, not many people can carry lightly on their conscience. Um, and if you look at psychopathic traits, well actually, you know, psychopathic traits are pretty well, uh, uh, pretty well represented in politicians and world leaders. You know, you think about it. You know, politicians have to, uh, and leaders have to deal with, with uh, all sorts of nasty kinds of crises during their administrations. Anything from the threats from rogue uh, states to natural disasters like hurricanes or floods. 
Uh, also though, they have to be pretty confident to run uh, for office at all. They have to be very good at presenting themselves in a certain light, um, and they have to be very persuasive and manipulative. There's probably a large area of crossover between bullies and psychopaths in the workplace. Bullying itself, it's usually described as being the regular and repeated belittling or humiliating or um, in some way intimidating a person, and it's usually a single person in the workplace, um, on a regular basis, as I said. If you look at the papers to do with bullying, it, it's, it seems to be in every organisation, um, and significant numbers of people have experienced it. Usually it's in the 30 and 40 percentages. And the other thing that struck me in reading about it is that companies and corporations and organisations don't seem to know what to do about it. They, they tend to want to sweep it under the carpet to pretend it doesn't exist. And quite often they'll do things like they'll pay off the people who are being bullied and they'll insert a clause into that payoff, into that contractual arrangement whereby they're not allowed to talk about it. So it all gets swept under the carpet. The bully, in the meantime, gets promoted, and they're the only one that, that, that's, that's left uh, in the organisation. But there are many ethical and financial reasons why bullying should not be swept under the carpet, and some of these are to do with individual reasons. So the, the negative effects, the psychological effects on the individual concerned are quite devastating. So they feel humiliated, belittled, um, their careers quite often get ruined or dis disjointed. They'll try and withdraw from the workplace. They'll, they'll uh, seek other jobs. Uh, and they end up um, in lesser positions or unemployed or in jobs they don't really want to do. And their confidence and motivation is, is destroyed at a personal level. So th there seems to be a sort of unspoken, underlying sense of bewilderment. Who are these people? Who are these people that enjoy watching people get hurt? Because it doesn't seem a normal thing to do, a normal thing to want to do or to enjoy doing. And they clearly enjoy it. So if you, reading about bullies, the, the, the words that are used to describe them are on the screen there. So they enjoy hurting other people. They're cruel, they're selfish, they're parasitic, Machiavellian. And you start to get, in the literature, a lot of words to do with um, uh, dissocial personalities. So anti-personality, antisocial personality disorder, sociopathy, psychopathy. And lots of these words are similar to words used to identify um, corporate psychopaths. Now, corporate psychopaths are those psychopaths which, who are about 1% of the population, just by the way, who go into organisational and corporate positions rather than into a criminal career. And psychologists have slowly come to realise that those from better socio-economic backgrounds, perhaps with a good education, good family background, work out fairly e early that it's far easier um, to get the power, the prestige and the money that they want from a corporate career than it is from, from a criminal career. And so they go into the corporate world. So the, the same words are used to describe them, uh, these psychopaths, uh, as are used to describe bullies, with the exception that psychopaths, the, the outstanding thing about psychopaths is they have absolutely no conscience. So there's nothing that inhibits them in terms of how they behave. They can be totally ruthless and sleep perfectly well that night because nothing they do bothers them because they don't have a conscience and there's no um, feeling, no emotion there in their, in their lives. So, having realised that there's probably a large link between psychopathy and psychopaths and, and bullying, I thought it would be interesting to do some research to see how large that link actually is. So I took a psychopathy measure from reading 200 and odd psychology papers on psychopaths, and embedded it in a management survey of management behaviour, um, firstly doing this in, in Australia. And what I found was, or the, one of the most um, outstanding things I, that I found was that uh, uh, psychopaths seem to be 
seem to account for around 26% of all bullying in that particular sample of managers, of, of Australian managers. It was 346 managers, the research carried out in 2008, I think. Um, and there were quite a few other interesting statistics there as well. I mean, under normal managers, employees encountered bullying less than once a month. If there were corporate psychopaths in the organization, then bullying went up to um, more than once a week, 1.3 times a week, I think it was. Because those results, and I, I measured loads of other things as well besides bullying, but that, that was uh, the interesting thing for the purposes of today. Because those um, uh, results were so dramatic, I repeated it again in the UK, and let's get the right slide, that one. And the, the, I found even more bullying in the UK than I found in Australia. And I found that psycho psychopaths and, and corporate psychopaths were accounted for mo more of, of that bullying than they did in Australia. So it's up to 36% of all bullying is down to the presence of corporate psychopaths in an organisation uh, in this sample. In conclusion, I think that what I've... Having established the link between corporate psychopaths and bullying, it, it starts to explain some of the big questions that there are to do with bullying. For example, why is it so pervasive in all companies uh, around the world and in all, in all countries? Well, the answer to that might be that because psychopaths are 1% of the population, if we assume they are normally distributed across the whole population, then they will be in every major company. There will be psychopaths, and if there are psychopaths, there will be bullying. So that, ex that explains why, psychopaths, why bullying is so common. The other thing it explains is why bullying occurs in the first place. Psychopaths bully for two main reasons. One of them is predatory. So they do it because they like it. They do it because they enjoy it. They do it because they like to see people squirm. They like to hurt people. They like to damage their careers. And that's the, the thing that's hard for the rest of us to understand. It's enjoyable. That's one of the reasons they do it. The other reason they do it is what I've called instrumental bullying. So they're doing it quite often to create confusion and chaos all around them so that they can forward their own political and social and career agendas while everybody else is emotionally distracted. So it creates a smokescreen for them to get on with what they are really doing, which is gaining power and influence and prestige and money within the corporation. So anybody, for example, a boss looking down on this whole situation of bullying and emotional reactions will see that the only person that seems to have kept their cool is this psychopath, because he started it all in the first place, and therefore the only person that seems like they wouldn't deserves promotion is the psychopath. So that's why it, it, it helps to answer the question of why psychopaths seem to get promoted at the hierarchy more than ordinary people do, because they create confusion around them, and that enables them to forward their own agenda to, uh, to um, promote themselves. Um, so if you think of, if you link it at an organizational level, companies like Enron, which was the biggest fraud in history at the time, before the global financial crisis and things like that, was reported to have a culture of bullying within it. And they bullied their agencies, they bullied their advisors, they bullied their suppliers to keep them in check and to stop them asking questions so that they could perpetuate this massive fraud that was going on for years. So it's a means to an end, as well as a, 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 an end in itself. Um, and I think bullying in corporate banks, for example, and, and linking it to the, corporate, uh, the global financial crisis was very evident as well. There's a culture of don't ask questions or you'll get into trouble. So no ethical questions are allowed in these institutions. Um, and it prevents, it enables them to get on with what they're doing, and they're fraud, and it prevents uh, people from exposing it. Human predators, including lethal predators and serial killers and, and those who operate with absolutely no empathy for others, without a conscience, without a feeling of guilt or, or embarrassment, 
they have no desire to conform to social norms. That's the psychopath. And, and some researchers claim that there's a meaningful difference between the words psychopath and sociopath. Uh, you know, if, if, if a person has no conscience, there will always be an argument about how they got that way. And the academics quibble about this, but the point is there are those among us and it's, who have no conscience. And to be at the extreme, again, is 1% or less, to be at the extreme of no constraint whatsoever on your behavior due to wanting to be good, uh, that's, that's the high end of the psychopathy scale. And it has nothing to do with being psychotic. It has, it has nothing to do with being out of touch with reality. These people understand reality very well. They are fully responsible for their deeds. Uh, and if the word evil has any meaning, these are the people who are evil and who do evil.